Good evening. What a delight to be here tonight, even though it was a bit challenging to get here. I felt like I needed a bicycle. <laughs> All the more reason our conversation tonight is so timely and important. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, a 1987 film in which two strangers, each desperately trying to get home for Thanksgiving, are forced to travel together in order to reach their destination. Much like us coming together tonight, although we have some different modes of travel that we can incorporate in our 21st century conversation, and we're happy to do that, and we'd like to get our conversation underway in just a moment. I wanna thank you for joining us again for the multimodal transportation in Central Arkansas panel discussion slash town hall meeting tonight presented by the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service, as well as Rock Region Metro. Not only is multimodal transportation in demand all across the country, it is also in demand right here in the natural state. With the 30 Crossing Project, a new Tiger Grant for the Little Rock Port Authority, a recent push for dedicated funding source for Rock Region Metro, the ongoing push for bike lanes, the recent creative corridor, streetscaping and phase plans, and the redevelopment of the area east of I-30, it is clear, very, very clear that addressing the evolving and regional state transportation needs is a key area of focus for Central Arkansas. So it is very important that we have some experts to talk about that with us tonight, to share their insights, and also to provide answers to your questions at the end of our segment. And leading our discussion are Brian Day, Executive Director of the Little Rock Port Authority, Mr. Art Guzzetti, Vice President of Policy for the American Public Transportation Association, Rex Nelson, Senior Vice President and Director of Corporate Communications for Simmons First National Corporation, Antoine Phillips, Associate Attorney for Wright Lindsay Jennings, and State Representative Warwick Sabin, a Democrat from Little Rock, the Senior Director of U.S. Programs for Winrock International. We want to say thank you very much, and would you please give our esteemed panelists a nice round of applause. As we mentioned to you just a few minutes ago, we will have an opportunity for you to engage in Q&A with our panelists, better them than me, being on the hot seat. But we're also going to ask our panelists to start our discussion tonight by briefly sharing a few details about themselves. And we'll start on the end with Brian. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Day, and I'm the Executive Director of the Little Rock Port Authority. Uh, just to show of hands, how many people here in the room even knew that Little Rock has a port? <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I've been out there a little over two years, and um, our primary function is economic development, working closely with the, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I saw the chambers here, uh, the city, the county, the state. Uh, we try to grow jobs for Central Arkansas. Prior to my time at the Little Rock Port Authority, I was the assistant city manager uh, for the city of Little Rock and did that for about a decade. Before that, I had the best job I've ever had, and that was the parks director for the city of Little Rock. And I see some friendly faces out here from all of our time with the parks. Um, I've been in government um, all of my adult life. I'm a Little Rock born and raised. I'm very proud of this community and look forward to our conversation this evening. Hi, uh, Art Gazzetti here from Washington, D.C. this morning. A lot going on in Washington this week, uh, needless to say. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I'm Vice President for Policy of the American Public Transportation Association. That's the national uh, trade association of all the transit systems in North America, and it's been that since 1882. Uh, a lot of change and uh, adaptation since that time. Uh, that predates 1882, the internal combustion engine itself. Uh, the, uh, uh, but we're a full service. Uh, we do the best practice practices of all the uh, uh, transit providers, the standards, the statistics, the research, the advocacy, uh, etc. My own career, um, I spent uh, the first eight years with New Jersey Transit. 
uh, with the statewide transit agency there. Spent uh, 10 years in my hometown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, working for the transit agency there, and then I had an opportunity to come uh, to Washington and uh, uh, where uh, it had to I deal with the policy and the politics and the funding and the strategic partnerships and the uh, uh, what we need to help uh, the transit industry excel. I'm here uh, basically to talk about, because of my fam familiarity with what's happening in other places around the country and, uh, uh, and bring those best practices. As Skip said, I'm the holdover for lunch, from lunch. I fell asleep on the couch back here and woke up late this afternoon. They said, you want to be on a panel? And I said, well, I'm already here. I might as well be. But I'm Rex Nelson from Simmons Bank. Uh, I am certainly no transportation expert, but what I am is a resident of Little Rock since late 18, uh, 19, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 1989, wow. Wow. 1989, when I escaped Washington, D.C., where Art lived and uh, now come and was able to come back home to Arkansas. Uh, I love Little Rock, I love Central Arkansas, and I want to see it be all it can be. And to be a real city of the 21st century, our transportation, multimodal transportation, doing something different than just getting in a car and commuting is going to have to be a key part of who we are as a city. I, I love the fact that Brian, for instance, now heads the Port Authority, and yet he used to head Parks and Little Rock, as he said, because that encapsulates what I go around the state writing about and preaching, and that is we've got to have this broad definition now of community development. We've got too many Arkansans still stuck in the old industrial development mode and we've got to have community development. And community development includes things like bike lanes and mass transportation. Ten years ago, if you had told me that a craft brewing scene was an important part of economic development, I'd have said, what? I will look you in the face now and say a craft brewing scene is an important part of economic development. Because economic development in the 21st century is no longer about attracting manufacturing plants. Economic development in the 21st century is attracting talented, educated people who could live anywhere, but they choose to live in your city because of its quality of life, and multimodal transportation is a huge part of that. I'm Antoine Phillips. I'm an attorney at Wright, Lindsay, and Jennings. I am a lifelong resident of Little Rock, other than the four years I was in Maine at Bowdoin College. Came back here uh, to start law school and practice law. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about my experience growing up in the city, uh, seeing transit develop, growing up using transit, uh, and seeing how it has changed and how it, I think it needs to change even more so going forward. Um, I give a kind of a preview of my thoughts. I think there's a stigma with public transportation in Little Rock that I was unaware of until I went to live on the East Coast. In the East Coast, everyone used public transit. And I come back home, I'm like, why do we look at people so funny when they get on and off the bus? Uh, so I'm gonna share my uh, thoughts and some stories about that tonight. And hopefully I can add uh, to the dialogue to help you and us uh, shape transit in the future. Think she took yours? I think so. <laughs> I don't have it. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, this will work. I'm not guilty. I'm uh, work saving, and, and as Pamela mentioned, I, I do serve as a senior director for U.S. programs at Winrock International, and in that capacity, I really focus on rural uh, community and economic development around the country. But I think for the purpose of this panel, I'm, I'm really wearing my legislator hat. Um, I represent District 33 in the Arkansas House of Representatives. I'm in my third term. And uh, for those of you who don't know where District 33 is, it's right smack dab in the heart of Little Rock. Um, it's all of downtown and really all the neighborhoods west of downtown, all the way to Reservoir Road, uh, including south of 630 uh, and the 12th Street corridor. So a very urban district, a very dense district, but yet obviously serving in the state legislature means, you know, I'm also getting a, a top level view of transportation issues statewide. And we're a very diverse state in that respect. And in my first term, I did serve on the Transportation Committee, so, you know, really got to kind of dig down deep into these issues. But, you know, I'll say that, that you know, kind of holding those two 
perspectives kind of simultaneously is, is really significant as we're sort of thinking about, you know, how do you design effective transportation systems for the 21st century? Um, obviously, here in Little Rock, you know, we need to be focused on, you know, moving people around efficiently, making it a place that's, uh, you know, really welcoming to, to the business community and, and for jobs. Um, and, and catering, you know, obviously to a sort of mix of residential and, and uh, commercial purposes all in the same place. And I think Rex made uh, some tremendously effective points that, that I would have made had you not already <laughs> made them um, about, you know, how culture really impacts uh, the kind of economic development that we want to see happen here in our city, here in central Arkansas. But, you know, I think for me, you know, the big issues that we're hopefully going to talk about today that impact, you know, multimodal transportation, you know, first of all have to do with the cost of infrastructure, uh, you know, the cost of not just, you know, building new infrastructure, but maintaining what we have. And the fact is, we're never going to have enough public money to do that. So we need to be thinking about what are those alternative modes of uh, transportation to move people around knowing that we'll never be able to, to afford, uh, you know, the kind of infrastructure that we became accustomed to in the 20th century. Uh, Rex mentioned the cultural changes, but there are also technology changes. And we need to anticipate, you know, where is transportation going? We know that we're going to have driverless cars. We already have driverless trucks. And building, again, for a 20th century transportation system doesn't make any sense when we already know what's coming in the 21st. Uh, energy is going to be a tremendous issue. So let's consider, you know, the cost of energy and, you know, what are sustainable ways to, you know, build a transportation system that doesn't use as much energy, knowing what an important commodity that will be. And then finally, you know, the financial imperatives. I, I think that uh, yeah, I've heard a lot of people make some really good points about uh, the tax base in Little Rock, for instance, and the fact that it's diminishing because, you know, a lot of people are able to get what they need or what they used to get in Little Rock in some of the outlying areas. So they're spending their dollars at malls and, and retail outlets and, you know, living outside of the city and commuting in. And that's really hurting uh, our ability to maintain basic social services in our own city. So to the extent that we're basically building a transportation system that's cannibalizing our city budget and killing our quality of life, maybe we need to think about a different strategy. And so to me, those are those overarching issues that I hope we talk about today. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your introduction of yourselves and telling a little bit more about where you are in this conversation. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the stigma. I want to address that in terms of how we get people thinking and talking differently about public transportation and intermodal transportation, if you will. Well, I'll uh, start by telling the stories. I grew up here, uh, single mom and a bunch of brothers and sisters, and a lot of times we didn't have a car. So we relied on what was then CAT, now Rock Region Metro, to get back and forth for my mom to get to work, for me to get to my cousin's house to spend the night for the weekend. Um, and I didn't think much of it because that's the way we got around when we didn't have a vehicle. But once you get into high school or middle school and you start to pay more attention to people around you, you realize people are talking about me because I ride the bus. Um, people look at you differently when you're in public transportation, uh, ride, using public transportation in Little Rock. And I thought maybe that was a high school thing and then I'd go off to college and go to the East Coast and see everyone riding subways and buses and cabs. And I remember one friend asking me, um, how about we just take the bus? And I was like, man, no one takes a bus. It's like, dude, we're in Boston. I was like, dude, I'm not taking a bus. I said, I'm from Little Rock. We don't take buses. That, that was my 18-year-old naive self um, talking about it. And then I learned, the obviously, the benefit you have when you have used public transportation. So coming back after college, st still seeing that stigma, still seeing the same kind of energy around those who use public transportation is an issue. And I've talked to my friends about it, talked to my wife about it, about what's ways to change it. Um, and I think it doesn't change until more people access these resources that are currently available. Uh, it's going to take people like us in this room not being deliberate about leaving our cars at home and taking the bus so they know when Antoine Phillips goes to Ryland's and Jenny's in the morning, 
he took the bus that dropped, stops right there at center and 4th Street. So I think that's one way to do it. Another way, um, speaking, giving a shout out to my wife, Tanisha, she couldn't be here, but we talked about this, and she suggested the idea of more of a campaign to show younger folks used in transit, whether it's YouTube videos or quarterly uh, videos or commercials showing younger folks using transit at all different times, not only to work, but to the river market uh, or to, you know, chili fights in the heights or whatever it is, just showing different ways to use transit to get rid of that stigma. And I don't think it, it goes away until more of us be intentional about accessing the resources we already have. Um, I'll say one more thing. I think this goes to representative savings point. A lot of times with transit, I think there is a chicken and egg issue. Uh, what, should we have more people? If more people ride the bus, then we have more resources for the bus. And in my conversations with the folks at Rock, Rock Region Metro, I think it's pretty clear it's not a chicken and an egg issue. We need more funding to allow people to have access. But in the meantime, I'm encouraging myself and everyone in this room to be intentional about our use of public transit to get rid of some of those stigmas that are attached to it. Thank you. I saw you nodding. Did you want to add anything to that in your travels around the country, Rex? Well, as I mentioned, I moved back here from Washington, D.C. in 1989. I lived on Capitol Hill. I would walk in and work out of 1889? Yeah, 18. Okay. <laughs> I would walk into the House Press Gallery where I was the correspondent for the Arkansas Democrat. And, uh, and so I never used my car except on weekends in those four years. So I had to get back into the car mode when I moved back to Arkansas. But we are seeing cultural changes. I mentioned that earlier. We, we're seeing this urban renaissance all over America. And sometimes it's a little more slow here, but in those 27 years that I've been back here, one of the great things I've seen is more and more downtown residential being built. Not, not as quickly as I would hope. I mean, in those 27 years, you know, I wish the Donaghy building was full of people now. I wish the Boyle building was already full of people. Those are classic Arkansas buildings that remain empty to this day. So it, it hasn't gone as quickly, but it is happening. And I think we're going to see that happen from a cultural standpoint with mass transportation also, just more slowly than some of us want it to happen. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add, and I'm going to focus my question right now on three pieces of research that my organization has done that I think are especially relevant to the, to the question here. The first one is something actually not out yet, but it will be out within the next week or two called Who Rides? And what it is, it looks at all of the onboard surveys that transit systems have done all over the country, and it tells a story from that. Unlike the statistics that you just see in numbers, what are people riding it for? Who is riding it? What are they accomplishing it? Is it the difference between them having a job and not having a job? And we're finding it is people of all walks of life. You know, maybe in, in Little Rock needs to catch up maybe a little bit there, but around the country, uh, it is impressive. People of all walks of life are using transit, call them choice riders. Second thing uh, I would commend is uh, a, a piece called uh, Millennials and Mobility, Understanding the Millennial Mindset. And it looks at the generational change in travel behavior. The baby boomers were put me down as one of those. They were predisposed to using the car. We were, you know, they used it. They couldn't wait till 16 to get the license. And then we built cities around that purpose of automobile use. Well, the millennials are different. It's not that they're a slam dunk for public transit, but they're open to it if you give them a good choice. If the good choice is something else, then they'll use something else, and they'll vary their trip choices, one trip to another, based on what that good choice is. The third thing, quickly, is uh, called the real estate mantra, transit, transit, transit. And it, it's showing that if a good transit hub is, uh, uh, the value is, uh, people val value the property higher than a similar piece of property not in proximity to a transit hub. So I'll pause there, but I just wanted to commend those three reports. Thanks, Art. Uh, Let's shift focus here for just a moment, and we talk, we're talking about the millennial. And how do you think the multimodal transportation infrastructure will affect Central Arkansas's desire to attract and retain young talent in our area? 
Okay, I'll take a step at that one too. And uh, I, I, I want to also defer to my panel who knows the local situation better. But I'll even add a, a, a fourth report to that. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, called the, it's on, hmm, I forget the name of it actually, but it's about the knowledge economy. And what that means is uh, every age has a uh, transportation system built for its time. The industrial economy had a transportation system you know, logically built for the industrial economy. The post-industrial service economy, same thing. Now, what the economy is really being rooted on in the hot spots around the country are rooted in the knowledge economy. And this report quantifies that public transportation is essential to making that economy work. The high tech uh, providing access to that pool of talented, high skilled workers, uh, making the urban economic engines productive, efficient, and competitive and creating the appeal that is very important. The, the, these knowledge workers, they want a community that's vibrant, they want vibrant places, and they want a community that appeals to what they want in life. Thank you. Um, Warwick, I wanted to bring you in on the conversation, and I'm coming to you, Mr. Day, in just a moment. But I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about, because you were the one who mentioned um, being able to, to pay for it. So. What do you think is keeping us from having more multimodal transportation investment opportunities? Well, I, I think it's pretty complicated, um, but I think it also has to do with how people understand the costs of infrastructure. And, you know, I think the, you know, the problem is sometimes is, you know, obviously you get the behavior that you incentivize. I mean, that's an economic fact, and it's built into, you know, any kind of public policy that you try to create. And right now, you know, people are incentivized to utilize their vehicle because that's kind of the, the infrastructure that we've built. Uh, we've made it really cheap and easy for people to do it. We've sold, you know, highway taxes and gas taxes and things like that as the cheapest and most efficient and painless way for people to understand, you know, what their transportation options are as opposed to public transportation, which we normally don't invest, you know, nearly as much money into. Um, so we, you know, are unable to sort of convey the value of that to people. Plus, you know, because they're having to pay for it, you know, per ride or whatever it is, they think they're paying more when really, if you were comparing apples to apples, you know, there are a lot of other costs that are kind of built into this, you know, again, this, this overarching infrastructure that we built. And, and it deteriorates, costs us way more money to expand and to maintain, and, and, and it's, un, it's really unrealistic and unfeasible because anytime, uh, anywhere in the United States that we've expanded, for instance, a highway, um, it's induced demand and it's created more wear and tear on the road and then demands either more maintenance or more expansion uh, without the requisite you know, cost to the consumer to, to pay for it. So we've hidden all the costs and, you know, again, people don't really, you know, value, you know, the infrastructure that we have in the appropriate way. So, you know, we're going to have to do a better job of helping people understand what all of these total costs are and why it's to everybody's benefit that we invest in more sustainable modes of transportation, ones that, again, anticipate how people actually, you know, want to, to travel. And, and I'll tell you, when you talk about the costs, it bleeds right into the millennial conversation because, you know, the, if you look at any studies, you know, about, you know, where the millennials want to live and work, uh, they want to live in places where they don't have to own a car. And some of that, again, is just the simple cultural fact of wanting to be in a, you know, an urban area where things are accessible by bicycle or, or by, you know, walking. Um, but some of that are those costs because what we've done with the millennial generation is we've overburdened them with college debt. Mm. And they're, you know, going to be paying off their college debt until, you know, they're ready to collect Social Security if it exists Amen. at that point. <laughs> so, so why then would they want to be burdened with a car note? Mm -hmm. and paying for gasoline and all those other things. So the millennials understand those hidden costs and the economics in that way that I was describing better than I think almost any other generation alive right now. And so let's have a reckoning about what we're really paying, what the overall cost of all this infrastructure is, how we all can lower those costs and benefit in our own pocketbooks but also as a society 
by investing in the smart way to move people from point A to point B. And I'll add to that conversation about the millennial. I've been told that I barely qualify, so <laughs> speaking as an expert here, um, the multitasking that you can do when you're on public transit is another huge benefit, especially with the Rock Region Metro adding Wi-Fi to their buses. There's been times I've ridden, rode the bus to work. I have my laptop, and as an attorney, I bill for my time. So that was like the few times where I could drive to work and make money, literally. Uh, and whether it's working, schoolwork, or whatever, I think the, the ability to multitask while using public transit would be another thing that would be very attractive to uh, millennials, millennials like myself, since I qualify. I just wanted to keep saying that. that I do. <laughs> and, and I'll add one quick thing to that uh, before we get back over to Brian, and that is one thing that I have found, and we, we talk about the need to attract young, educated, talented people, that that is economic development in the 21st century. One thing they want is choice. You know, not all of them are going to choose to ride a bike, not all of them are going to choose to ride a bus, but they want to have that option. They don't want it to be car or nothing. They want to have the choice of good sidewalks if they're close enough to walk, bike lanes if they bike, a bus system that has the right routes at the right times that make sense for their job, or even a trolley system that's meant for something other than just tourists, perhaps, as more and more people live downtown. They want to have those choices, and going forward, this city is going to have to provide those choices if they want to attract those kind of people. Thank you, Rex. And I think there's actually been a, a, a pretty good marriage of the biking community and the bus community, but obviously there's room for improvement because most of the bike lanes uh, perhaps are not used as effectively as they could be. And then with some of the other biking opportunities, it's mostly recreational. So uh, this conversation has an opportunity to help us explore a number of areas where we might work to improve. Okay, Brian, let's get you into this conversation and talk a little bit about um, inland waterways and how uh, they have an impact on our travel. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I want to do for just a couple of minutes is uh, talk about the Little Rock Port Authority, um, talk about, we, we're basically talking about community building and, and providing transportation and, and roadways and public transit routes and bike lanes to move people. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute and explain to you why I think that's an important conversation to have and, and why it's good to see a room full of people here that are interested in that. But before I do that, let me just tell you a little bit about the Port Authority. In 1959, uh, the community leaders of Little Rock went out in a bean field on the Arkansas River. Before the Arkansas River was even built, it was just a kind of a stream that flooded four or five times a year, and they said, we're going to build a port. And who would have thought that 60 years later today, we have a 3,000 acre industrial part, we have, uh, we have companies from five countries that are represented there, and there are 4,000 people that call the port home between the hours of 8 and 5. There's actually shift work, but 4,000 people come to the port, and they come from about a 12 to 15 county area. So we've got to design a system, a smart system, that moves people from the suburbs, the bedroom communities, through our downtowns, through our neighborhoods, out to the port. Um, and that is a real issue as we compete for jobs, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. But it is important that we also in include in this conversation the moving of freight. And, and freight can be moved basically three ways. It can be moved on trucks, and there's a lot of them in Arkansas. I drive to Memphis some afternoon. Um, it can be moved on rail cars, and there's a lot of rails that come through Arkansas. Union Pacific has a huge presence, so does Burlington Northern and some others. Or it can be moved on the Inland River system. And quite honestly, um, the Inland River system, the Arkansas River, is uh, nowhere near capacity. Uh, we could hold, handle a whole lot more, but it's complicated. It's not easy 
but it's getting a little bit better and businesses are starting to look for those bottom lines. But if you go out, just to give you an illustration, if you go out and stand on the Big Dam Bridge uh, one Saturday morning and you see a barge tow coming up or down the river, in all likelihood it has 15 barges on it. That's about all that can be handled on this river system. Some of the bigger rivers can handle more. But those 15 barges, if they're full of grain or fertilizer or rock or steel coil or scrap, that's equivalent to probably about a thousand semi-trucks. Kind of gives you an idea of the volume. Assuming, and, I, and this number's low, but we can assume that the Arkansas River handles 500 barge tows a year, a little over one a day, but it's probably more than that. I'm just trying, I want to give you realistic numbers. That's 550,000 semis worth of stuff that would, if the river didn't exist, would be on the roads. Um, and so, as we talk about transportation, we can't lose sight, sight, sight of the freight component, but we're really here to talk about moving people. Let me tell you why that's important. I'm an economic developer in my new job, and when we compete for businesses, we're no longer competing with just Memphis and Dallas and Kansas City. We're competing with China and Mexico and, and Europe. And they're looking, for they're looking for places that people want to live. They're looking for places that can provide a qualified and accessible workforce. And so if we have a prospect that comes to town and says, you know, we need 800 employees, and we have some, and we have some businesses at the port that have that many employees, and they start looking around um, Little Rock, 800 doesn't sound like a lot of people, but it is a lot of people in the state that has a 3.9% unemployment rate. And so they're looking for how can we get people to the port? Is there good public transit? Are there good road networks? Are there other ways to get there? Are there neighborhoods close that people can walk to? And that becomes a real issue for a small rural state. And Jay Cheshire, and, and who I saw in the back of the room, is an economic developer. He struggles with that every day. So if we can build a good, smart network of roads and bike lanes and public transit and easy access and lack of congestion, Ms. Smith, you're, something happened on the interstate tonight and, and the whole thing shut down. That's why it was so hard to get here. Mm -hmm. And that shows the value of a good network system. But it is, it is an important conversation to have. There are no easy answers. I want to play off something just real quick that uh, Representative Saban talked about. If you look at infrastructure investment around the world, riverways, transportation, airports, roads, bridges, highways, America is way down at the bottom. We're not investing in our infrastructure. Now there's this great debate and argument about what we should be investing in, and that's, that's a conversation for another day. But the truth is, if we don't continue to invest in whatever that transportation or that infrastructure is, we are no longer gonna be able to compete. And, and it's expensive and it's complicated, and there are no easy answers, but our airports are out of date, our, our interstates are crumbling, our waterways, the Arkansas River is the newest waterway in the system and it's over 50 years old and has about a billion dollars worth of critical needs today and multiply that towards all of that. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be here and hopefully there'll be some more dialogue about what we do. We're mostly here about moving people and, and, and getting people through and across our community, but we can't lose sight of the freight. I'm gonna just take one second and recognize one of my bosses in the back of the room, Frank Scott, one of my board members. He's, raise your hand, Frank, don't hide. And then my, then my other big boss, Mayor Stodola, came in and he's over there in the corner, so I just wanna point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, I would like for you, if you don't mind, since this you're the real expert on this panel. Uh, talk about a similarly sized city who has effectively used or incorporated intermodal transportation systems. Yeah, I've uh, I thought about that a little bit in, uh, in preparing to come here. Uh, a few cities I'd say, and I'm just going to give a kernel on each one because there's a story behind each one, and I'd be happy to do that, but I, I want to just give you a little teaser perhaps on, on all of them. Uh, one city I would say is, uh, is uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, Grand Rapids is similarly sized. I haven't looked up the stats, but I'm, I'm feeling that it is. Uh, it is a, a remarkably vibrant downtown for a city its size. It also has a presidential library like, uh, uh, like, Fort, uh, like uh, Little Rock does. It has the Gerald Ford uh, Museum there right along the river uh, there in, in Grand Rapids. A lot of, uh, it was mentioned about brew pubs, and <laughs> uh, who knew that was a sign of urban, urban vitality. But uh, people come, you know, people, people come to those places. And, and have a good time doing it, and that's part of the experience. But they have, a, a, they've invested in uh, the bones, the bones of a good system, because they have high capacity corridors. Those corridors are going to be ripe and vibrant. You know, uh, if it, the corridor is weak and low capacity, and the bus comes every 40 minutes, look out, that's in trouble. 
You want a corridor that has frequent service, solid service, because that is what your community is going to grow around. Those kind of places. Again, just moving on quickly, Eugene, Oregon, very sim similar thing. They have bus rapid transit in that community. Uh, and what's the uh, indication of success when you build one and your community wants to build more? Well, that's what's happening in Eugene. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I mentioned them because they, they're in that research triangle in North Carolina. You had uh, Durham County uh, that has invested or, or you know, voted for resources for the development of a regional system. You have Orange County, uh, 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 Chapel Hill also doing the same thing. But then you had Wake County that was a little, little reluctant. It's probably arguably the most conservative of those three. Well, the election last November, November 8th, which is a landmark day for transit elections, they now join the party too. So that region's uh, full, full speed ahead. Uh, let me mention Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they also passed a referendum. Uh, some good things happening there. Uh, I do want to mention uh, Spokane because they lost two years ago, but came back, and this year, the past year they won. So part of that is part of the education process. When you lose, that doesn't mean it's all bad. It just means your community maybe is a little more educated uh, in, in going forward. And finally, I want to mention one that's maybe just a little bigger, but actually the city's about the same size as, uh, as uh, Little Rock, and that's Salt Lake City. Remarkable story there because they, uh, they said, hey, listen, we're, we have water on one side, we have mountains on the other, but we want a pro-growth strategy. What can it be? And really, uh, the, arguably the most conservative state in the country, Utah, has rallied around public transportation and built it as, you know, every one year they had four new openings in one year. And that's the kind of uh, emphasis they're putting on it because they know that is the way for the region to grow and the only way the region is going to grow is to grow efficiently and that's their vision. Thank you, Art. You talked about investing in, bon in the bones. Uh, I would like for Representative Sabin to talk about how do we get folks to invest in the bones? And by the bones, we're talking about hopefully Rock Region Metro and, and some other uh, good sustainable modes of transportation. And, and I think, you know, I think the Rock Region Metro did an excellent job, you know, in the last campaign of, you know, trying to educate the public about the need, uh, not only for, you know, the kind of sustainable transportation system we can have, but, you know, how it can work very effectively. And in fact, you know, I think what they've designed is a very compelling proposal. And I, I say that as a member of the kind of commission that they put together that involved a lot of stakeholders from around the community that were engaged in a process to kind of come up with the plan that led to um, the election last year. Um, and, and it was really about improving the service and making it more effective. I mean, to your point, you know, uh, it really doesn't help uh, when, you know, buses don't arrive frequently because then, you know, people can't depend on it to get, you know, where they need to get on time and, and to use it effectively. And, um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, what, what Rock Region Metro kind of put forward was uh, a sort of vision of how this could work in a sustainable way. But, you know, there is a, that chicken and the egg problem, too, that, that somebody mentioned here where, you know, it's hard to sell uh, a vision like that when people aren't already using the buses. And, and I remember specifically uh, our statewide newspaper editorialized against the election, uh, or sorry, the, the initiative, basically by commenting on the fact that one of the editorial writers saw a bus go by in the middle of the day that was pretty empty. Um, so, you know, obviously that was a, sort of a irrational extrapolation to say the least, but also speaks to the, it, it really didn't even, you know, wasn't even a relevant point. I mean, we're trying to improve a service so that more people will use it. And the fact that, you know, people aren't using a service is not uh, evidence of the fact that we don't need to improve it. So, you know, I, I, again, I think that, you know, how do we sort of improve the bones? I think we continue the education process, to, to Art's point. Um, I think we have made a lot of progress. I think we need to make another run at it. Um, I think it takes people like those who are here in the room today to kind of convey to the rest of the community, your colleagues, you know, whether it's the business community, whether it's the education community, um, 
you know, the why we need to have this, what, why it's so important. I mean, to the business community, it reduces labor costs. I mean, and, and in fact, it moves uh, an employee base around the city much more efficiently than having to depend on somebody, you know, who may be, you know, in a, in a low income job to have to own a car to get from one side of the city of, to the other uh, just to have a job. Um, cities that have effective transportation systems have a lower labor cost, period. And that's something I think the business community can get behind. I think making you know, a city where people want to live is important to the point we made earlier about you know, having a, a strong tax base, about attracting talent. Um, it's critical. And just you know, for our quality of life, I mean, you know, do we want to continue to have to pay a lot of money in taxes to maintain aging infrastructure, to you know, make it so that you know, people can move you know, through our city and to and from our city and not have to live in our city? Uh, you know, what are those investments that are truly going to benefit everyone in Little Rock and Central Arkansas uh, as opposed to sort of, you know, really a, a few what I would call special interests that gain when we just continue to do things the same old way? So again, I, I think we need to keep making the case um, and, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Rex? Yeah, it does come down to communication and education. And um, as Art said, sometimes you have to lose an election. I've dealt in politics long enough to at least start the conversation, and then later you can come out and win. But what is ultimately going to ha have to happen is we're going to have to convince that voter out there who may never climb on a bus that it is in his or her best interest as a resident of Central Arkansas that they support this. And uh, I, I'm stereotyping here, but sometimes that's what you do when you write a column, you use an example. So let's say that guy who's sitting out at Pleasant Valley Country Club having a drink and he's moaning about the fact that, uh, oh gosh, you know, you, I hear Northwest Arkansas is beating our brains out. Well, first of all, I'll say, I'm an Arkansan. I think it's great what's happening in Northwest Arkansas, but I'm a resident of Little Rock. More power to them. Let's make Little Rock all it can be and quit worrying about what somebody else is. And to make Little Rock all it can be, this is gonna to have to be a piece of the puzzle. And we're gonna to have to convince that stereotypical guy out in West Little Rock I was just talking about who will never climb on a bus, that it is a piece of the puzzle and Little Rock's gonna be a better place for his children and his grandchildren if he supports this. Thanks, I Pam. see two people chiming in now. We'll take Art first and then we'll yeah, come to you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, just to, uh, I wanted to jump in because I want to uh, tag, tag on to Rex's uh, point there, and that's that around the country, uh, for a long period of time, it's remarkably how consistent it is, about 70% of the elections win on transit, and that's, uh, you know, uh, and people, they're paying money for these. They're saying, they will raise my taxes, I want more transit. It's remarkable the percent is that high, but not a one of those elections is there a majority of the people who actually ride transit, right? So you're getting the non-transit riders. The, the, the expression, uh, some of us use it, all of us need it. So the campaign has to appeal to the non-transit rider. Thank you. I, I was just gonna chime in again from my personal experiences. Now, I don't go to the Pleasant Valley Country Club, but I'm a West Little Rock resident now. Um, and there, and this goes back to kind of the bones of, of the, Rock Region Metro in particular, when I take the bus, I live in St. Charles, I have to leave, I have to get in my car to get to the bus, which seems kind of counterintuitive. So I think that's part of the investment in the, uh, in the bones is making sure there's a way not only to have more stops, but places that I can walk to my bus stop. It'd be hard for me to walk down Chanel to get to the bus stop as opposed to a dedicated route. So I think that's another way to invest in the bones. It's not only the busing and having more routes, but having access to those routes, whether it's sidewalks or what have you. So a person like me, I don't have to park my car, leave my house, park at Sam's, and wait on the bus to get downtown, which I have done, but that's not the most efficient way. Well, I'm going to put on my education hat now. So how do you see this impacting educational opportunities? Anyone well, let me just to tackle? I'll, I'll take that. I'm on, I'll answer that in just a second, but I want to go back to what we got. We kind of got off on the election or a campaign 
and I want to make an observation about that. Putting my 22-year um, local government hat on, um, one of the challenges to running a campaign of this nature, I think, at least in this community, is it is multi-jurisdictional. And you, you know, the, the, the system, the transit system, serves a number of communities. And, and quite honestly and unfortunately, we don't play well together over on certain things. And so if another campaign, I know we're, we're kind of digressing a little bit, but if another campaign is uh, run, whoever runs that campaign is gonna have to figure out how to bring a, a whole county together. And every community is proud and every community is different and every community has different needs. Um, the folks in Jacksonville um, have different needs than the folks in West Little Rock. And that's just a challenge. It's, um, it's tough to bring those communities together in this community for whatever reason. Education, I'll just make a point that I was fortunate enough and blessed to serve on Little Rock School Board for three years way back when. And um, have, providing access to young people to schools um, is, is critical. The transportation system that the school districts run um, they do a good job of it, but it's complicated and it's, it's, it's not redundant. And if we had a good public transit system and it was frequent and it was high volume, high, what was the word used, high, high volume routes, high capacity routes, and the schools were close, um, I think it, it, it gives, it, it provides another choice. And it really, everything we do in this community should be about choice. It, people should have multiple choices. And so that's how it impacts education. If we get a good system that works, um, we have um, safe ways to get to and from the system and to and from the schools. Um, it helps our superintendent, it helps our school boards, um, and um, it gives those kids a choice to, to go to the public school um, and, and I, I just, there's, there's no harm can come from having a better public transit system. And, and back to the politics of it, Pam, it's really the same thing to, to your job. I did see Superintendent Poor here. Thank you for being here tonight. When the Little Rock School District goes to the voters, it, it's just the same as I was talking about. Uh, Rock, the Metro has to attract those voters who are never going to get on a bus by the same token the Little Rock School District is going to have to attract that man and that woman whose kids are in private schools. And you're going to have to sell that message that Little Rock is never going to be all it can be until the Little Rock School District is all it can be. And it's the same with multimodal transportation. You've got to sell that message to those people that might not use it, but they want Little Rock to be all it can, it can be. Well, thank you. We certainly want Little Rock to be all it can be. <laughs> Many of you travel very frequently, well, very infrequently, I guess that would be kind of redundant, but uh, tell us a little bit about the outcomes you've observed in the regions where you've traveled that have had strong multimodal transportation investments. Art, and you can start off uh, with this response and to describe the degree to which the transit and alternate transportation ballot measures are a spark for making regions stronger. Yes. Yeah, it, uh, it often, when you uh, transform your region uh, into, uh, you know, of course the transportation is the, the bedrock for broader goals. You want a community with vibrant places that has the appeal of that with an urban energy and vitality around it, right? But you start with a, a self-help, and a lot of the cities around the country, the regions around the country that have uh, experienced a rebirth uh, started with a, a local initiative. Uh, that helps leverage uh, uh, other funds uh, uh, that come with it uh, uh, along the way. Um, so uh, it, it does start with a, a, almost a vision. Uh, let me mention about, I mentioned Salt Lake City before and the fact that they're constrained by a county. They asked their community, what kind of future do we want? And here's a bunch of scenarios. Let's do a little scenario planning exercise. You know, we can have a, uh, you know, a, a system based on uh, fewer choices or a system based on more choices. And this is what it'll look like under this scenario, and this is what it'll look like under this scenario. And a lot of the cities, uh, you know, when you ask those questions and ask them that way, people are gonna vote for the walkable community with vibrant urban places. The final point I'll squeeze in here, Pam, there's as much change going on in transportation as there's been in 100 years. 
Uh, that's a profound statement in some ways, and it's a pretty obvious statement in other ways, right? All these technology-driven changes are going to be more than just technology. They're going to change the way regions look. And think very hard about that. I was at the Conference of Mayors meeting last week, and they said, well, okay, all these technologies are upon us. They're all good. They're all market opportunities, etc." But we got to choose the f future we want from this. Let's have some policy principles that guide us. If you have, say, automated cars, and they're coming, and we have to position ourselves in that evolving mobility ecosystem, position ourselves the right way. But the, I, I can tell you the mayors last week at the Conference of Mayors and a month before that, the National League of Cities are saying, you know, uh, we, if, if the result of that is going to be a place that's less walkable, less vibrant, less a sense of place, Let's think if that's really, really what we want. And I can tell you with, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I can elaborate on that, but I think I'll leave that point for now. We've made some mistakes with the interstate highway system. It was arguably right for its time. It brought growth to America. But let's think a little better this time. Thank you. Brian. Thank you. Um, I, as, as the, the, going back to the question is what do we where, when we travel what do we see I'm lucky enough to travel a lot um, and and we go, I go to all the big cities I mean and I imagine most of you in this room have been to the big cities and if you go to a, a DC or Baltimore Chicago or Dallas or Atlanta San Francisco you have a, a, a dependable public transportation system I would go so far to say if you if you did a little exercise in your head and you say where were three places I'd like to live in America besides Little Rock probably one of those common themes is good public transit but you know what you don't have to be a big city if you have, if you ever been to Crestview Butte Colorado I love I'm a big hiker and camper I go to these little towns they have an incredible bus system you, all these young people, you can't afford to buy a house there, so they're all living together and coming, but you, they don't have to have a car. They've got this great bus system that comes up and through the valley and takes them to places of work and home. Marfa, Texas, out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, have you ever been to Marfa? I mean, you've got to be going there to get there. They've got an incredible public transit system, and, they can, and you can rent bikes. They have the, the bike system where you put the quarter or the credit card in the machine and get bikes in Marfa, Texas. So sometimes we think you've got to be big and you've got to be rich and wealthy, but that's not true. If you want to be a great community, you have to have great transportation alternatives, and there are small communities that do that very well. Well, it's that whole quality of life picture that I was talking about. I mean, when people my age were coming out of college, you say where you want to live, and it was Dallas or Atlanta. Now it's just as likely to be Charleston, South Carolina, or Savannah, Georgia, somewhere that is considered cool, that has a great quality of life. And, and Little Rock fits into that size and can be that kind of place. Thank you. And we need to give a special shout out. I heard that the mayor was in the room. Uh, he's certainly been one who has advocated for a strong, uh, here you are, mayor, encouraging, <laughs> encouraging folks to uh, take the bus. Some of us have availed ourselves to that opportunity. Uh, but it is important to continue this conversation, and I think uh, perhaps some folks who are here tonight are here just for information purposes, but you might be preaching to the choir uh, in some instances. So what do we do to spark a movement if we want this to be improved? Okay, Mr. <laughs> They're like, don't look at me. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that um, from a couple perspectives. I think that um, on an issue that, that and I'm, I'm assuming we're going to talk about a movement on how to build a, a better people moving system, which really comes down to how do we fund our public transit system. I think what I would suggest are, are two things. One is that um, we have to be, um, it's not going to be, it, it will not be an easy sell. And it goes back because there are people that, that, uh, that don't use the system. There are people that don't believe in the system. There are people that see the empty bus going down Main Street and they don't understand the system. And so if we're, if we're gonna advocate it, if you're in this room gonna advocate for this system, I, I, the first thing I would say is, uh, is be open-minded to those other perspectives and try to educate those um, and, and, and not, not a way that's caustic and combative as this society is becoming, but just you know, sit down and explain it. I think the other thing is if we're gonna do it, um, ditch the keys, you know, and, and use the system. I, I, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I would venture to say that not everyone in here has ridden the bus system. 
I, I'm just going to take, don't raise your hand. I don't want to be proven wrong. But my guess is that not every one of us have used the system. So if we're going to go out there and we're going to grow this movement, we're going to grow this campaign, respect other ideas and try to educate them, but then also become an advocate and a user of the system. And I would jump on that um, and piggyback what Brian said. Uh, we have to be intentional as a community about uh, life in Little Rock on all facets, including transit. It's one thing to be visionary and say, I want to have a great city. I want to have a great transit. But in addition to being visionary, we need to be like surgical. Like what does it take? What are the, the steps? And I know that's what Becca and Jared are doing at Rock Ridge Metro to support, to meet that vision. So I completely agree being intentional in how we use transit, encouraging our family and friends to use transit in that way. And again, I bring back uh, showing the uh, availability and the accessibility of the current resources we have. Obviously, we want more, but when we're intentional, sharing our positive experiences with each other about transit, um, showing, hey, I took the bus to work and it worked out great. Or I rode my bike from downtown all the way to the big damn bridge on a Saturday and it was beautiful. I walked from here to there, sharing those stories to kind of build that uh, grassroots momentum in support of transit, I think is a big idea. And also, I think I've talked to Beck about this for a concerted campaign showing that it's cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's okay to ride the bus. It's okay uh, to walk. It's okay to take your bike to work or wherever. And I think if we can kind of get those messages out to the, to the community, uh, I think that'll be part of the steps. Of, of answering your question, Pam, but I completely agree, Brian. We have to be intentional uh, about our use of transit. Well, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, I, I, I see Pat Hayes and Buddy Valines, and you had Jim Daly, the old three amigos, and uh, for decades, as you know, we turned our back to this tremendous resource called the Arkansas River that we have running between these two cities. And uh, just through sheer grit and determination, uh, they brought us back to the river and uh, gave us this great trail system and these bridges and uh, now we're we're building things that actually face the river I, i'm thinking of the new addition on the back of the robinson center mm -hmm. which is just gorgeous and, and we brought us back to the river but it didn't happen without a lot of headaches and it didn't happen overnight and this is not going to happen without a lot of headaches and it's not going to happen overnight but we do among our leadership need that shared vision again and make sure we're working toward that on a daily basis I forgot to say something. Can I go back? <laughs> Let's check with our timekeeper. You have one minute. One minute. Uh, and exa exactly. I'm a lawyer, so I have to make sure I have an exact amount of time. Uh, back to the intentionality, I think one thing that we're already doing, I apologize for not mentioning it, but the chamber in Cray Little Rock has started to think big Little Rock think tank with a number of young professionals, age 25 to 40 that are being intentional about a lot of issues that the city is, is facing. One of those issues is transportation. So there is currently already an effort of a group of folks being intentional about how transportation affects our life today, how it's gonna affect our life in the future, and how it's gonna attract more talent back to Little Rock. So I apologize for not sharing that, but thank you for allowing me to give a plug to Think Big and, and the effort that's already in, in the works. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to comment before we begin our question and answer session with the audience? Uh, I'll make one comment, uh, Pam, on that last uh, question about uh, how do you go from giddy up to go on a lot of these things. And I'll give you one other number here. On November 8th, one day alone around the country, uh, voters approved $170 billion for public transportation alone. It was a historic day for investment. And that shows you what your, your competition is doing in, in cities around the country. But in those uh, communities, I'd say what's the common thread? Uh, you know, the, the, the vision, the plan. You need a plan, of course, to, to put forward. I can see the seeds of that already here. I can also see the seeds that there's the right, a lot of the right people in the room right now. So if that plan is rallied around loudly and vociferously and emphatically by your business community, your neighborhood leaders, and your political leaders, uh, you're off to a great start. Thank you very much. We're going to ask Becca Green to come up now and give us some housekeeping rules regarding our Q&A, and then we will get started. Please welcome Becca.
Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, thank you to our panelists. Uh, that was an excellent conversation, and um, I hope you'll remain there and jump in on some of the questions that we'll have from the audience. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask that you keep your questions brief because there are a lot of people here, and I, I feel like we may have a lot of questions. And I just want to show show of hands, but I think uh, no one will be embarrassed about this. Who in here uses any mode of multimodal? I'm talking ride sharing, carpooling, cycling, walking, transit, something that's yeah, okay, great. So everybody here has something uh, that's important to them. Even if you're not using transit, maybe you're, you're into cycling and you're worried about bike lanes, but they're all kind of connected and I think we've heard a lot about how tonight. So um, I know there are a couple of transit riders who are regular riders in the room who have specific, very specific questions about routes. And um, I just wanted to ask Jared, if you would, uh, Jared Varner, our executive director of Rock Region Metro, to just explain briefly about how we're funded because I know that question is gonna come up and answer a lot about the questions that we have related to routes. I'm not telling you not to ask your question, but I do want Jared to, to talk about how we're funded because that impacts what we do with our route system greatly. Thanks, Becca. Appreciate everybody being here. Just uh, real quick, um, quick primer. We, so we have six wonderful funding partners, uh, Little Rock, North Little Rock, Maumelle, Sherwood, Jacksonville, and Pulaski County all pay into the system. And basically those are annual apportionments. So every single year, your transit system goes to the jurisdictions with their hand, or the hat in hand and asks for their annual apportionment to fund service. Uh, as you can imagine, it's with the cities, they have uh, a long laundry list of needs that they have to fulfill. And so sometimes it's difficult or, or uh, impossible for the transit investment to grow. Um, it, the, the, the other issue when it comes to individual routes and, and you know, how do we get more buses on this route, more buses on that route, so all the cities pay in cities in the county pay in, and the, there's a formula of funding that is very fair, but also locks us into a system that was developed in 1984. Um, basically, it's all by miles. So each system, each, each city and the county pay based on the miles operated in their jurisdiction. So what you can imagine is, so it's this tangled web, right? So what happens is if I change a route out in the county, well, that's going to decrease their miles, and everyone else's percent of the overall miles goes up. So when I got on board as a brand new executive director, I thought, well, we've got these bus out here that's just not carrying very many people. I called Judge Valines and asked, why is this route running? He let me know the story. And I said, well, what if we tweaked it some? What if maybe we had one less bus? So taking buses off of this route out in the county that at the time wasn't carrying very many people shot everyone else's apportionment up. So Little Rock is going to pay $100,000 more because we're going to decrease miles out in the county or uh, in Sherwood or Jackson or where, wherever it was at the time. And so it's a tangled web. Uh, it's very difficult to increase funding. It's very difficult to look into the future and, and fund a vision uh, based on the current funding structure. So hopefully that answers the question. It's, it's difficult, one, from the cities, annual apportionments, and all the routes are, are, are intertwined. It's very difficult to move service from one area to another. Hope that accomplished what you wanted to, Becca. Maybe we have a microphone, and oh, we do in the audience, okay. If you would uh, kindly raise your hand. We have a lady up front who would like to ask a question. Thank you. Hi. I have a question about currently the Broadway Bridge is down, and I know coming here tonight, and anytime I come into town or downtown, it's a horrible mess. And I'm wondering if Metro has thought at all to offer like a week of free transportation on the buses for people who are going from downtown to their homes, and if that might be a way to get people starting to ride the bus. Jared, I think that might be a question for you. <laughs> I would defer to Jared, but I know there is at least a few days throughout the year where there is free riders, because I've taken advantage of those. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We do take some opportunities to, to offer free service. Uh, recently, the King Holiday, we offered free service. Um, our board recently uh, authorized the, uh, the, uh, to allow staff to offer free service on any election day. So any countywide election, uh, you can ride for free, to get one, to get people to the polls, but also to allow people to try the system. Uh, so with Broadway Bridge, what our intent was, uh, not, not so much to allow people to ride free for a week, I mean, it's a six-month program, and so allowing people to ride free for six months would have had a very negative impact on the finances of, of the agency. Um, but what we did was we presented a plan, put together a plan uh, for, for supplemental service. And so what our hope and desire was, was for the funding source that funds Broadway Bridge 
And, and I think you can extrapolate this to 30 Crossing as well. So the funding source for that, can you offer supplemental transit service during that time period to flex people off of, out of their cars and get them onto transit? Unfortunately, funding for transportation is very, very siloed. Uh, and so we don't have that opportunity to get to add supplemental service to help people get from point A to point B. Uh, and then just offering free service for an ex extended amount of time just isn't financially viable. So what we would prefer is when we do major infrastructure projects, it's going to make it take you forever to get from you know, uh, Benton and Bryan or wherever to get to work in Little Rock or to get from one side of Little Rock to the other. Well, let's, let's, let's uh, get rid of those silos from a funding standpoint and get HTD or, or whoever else is funding the program to think about well, what do we do in the meantime. It's not just detour signs. Uh, let's give people a way to get out of their car. Uh, you know, we can fit 50 people on a bus if we need to. Uh, how do we get them out of their car and onto a bus uh, during that during that program? Thank you. Next question. Hi. Um, several. Um, one would be maybe to Jared. Are there better funding systems that other places use? Um, and I'm not a marketing person. I'm actually in the email I saw RR Metro, and that's kind of what I thought this was about. Um, but I did have a marketing idea, and I'll just throw it out. And it's about uh, perhaps how to appeal to non-users. And it would be uh, something like, um, well, uh, the folks who use the, the transit system draw your blood, change your bedpans, bag your groceries, um, serve you at your restaurants, go to school to be better citizens um, and workers. Um, uh, can't read my writing. Um, uh, are, you, are going to be your nurses, your doctors, your lawyers, because they're going to UAMS, they're going to Bowen, et cetera. Um, that's my marketing idea. Um, and. Um, uh, also, um, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the city gives money to the Chamber of Commerce, and, act, and, and I apologize if that's wrong, um, and they might consider giving it to RR Metro because that helps businesses, both their um, patrons and their employees. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanted to say originally was just to um, give an idea of uh, the how much room um, there, there needs to be an improvement. Um, this bus system does not work 24-7, um, uh, 365 days a year, um, and we all live 24-7, 365. Um, uh, the healthcare system, the folks who work there are 24-7, 365. You, you, you can put it all together. It, it makes zero sense. Um, that's pretty basic that we need to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. What do you think about that marketing strategy, uh, communications guru? <laughs> I'm contemplating all of that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for offering that suggestion. Do we have another question? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Alternative funding systems. Jared. It, it is uh, amazing how many different funding sources there are. Now, uh, the sales tax is a typical one, uh, but uh, some of the communities I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, in Indianapolis, I, I didn't mention that, but I uh, it was on my list. Uh, they just voted in November uh, on an income tax. Uh, to fund their transit system. Uh, Grand Rapids uses property tax. There are registration fees. The list is huge. It's really, it becomes in a political sense, the path of least resistance, where mm -hmm. you can find uh, the votes. <laughs> the votes, uh, that's the, that is the way. But around the country, certainly there are, there are many examples. I might just piggyback on that. Um, and the, the policy makers and the managers don't necessarily like dedicated revenues because it does, it makes things less flexible. But for anything, be it a, a transit system, a park system, um, a, some form of dedicated revenue is really the only way that an organization can control its own destiny. And if it de this one depends on other jurisdictions who have a lot of other problems, our revenues aren't growing, the cost of doing business is getting greater, the challenges are becoming more complicated. So um, some form of dedicated revenue for this bus system is the only way, the only way that it will ever be successful. Thank you. So, 
obviously I agree with what Brian is saying, but um, I think it's important to note that in Arkansas, the state legislature uh, only allows for one source of dedicated funding for transit, uh, and it's sales tax, and it's capped at a quarter percent. Thank you. Next question. So mine's a... Mine's, um, I'm from England, um, lived over here a long time, and I hate to admit this, but I have never ridden the transit in, uh, in Little Rock. When, growing up in England, that's all I ever did. And it was so common, that's what everybody did, rode the bus, the train, that's how we got around. My parents never had a car, and a lot of my friends and neighbors never had a car. When I came over here, and I've been over here a long time, um, it seemed, um, one, I didn't know about it for a long time, um, and then it just seemed like it was, um, I didn't know how to get the information. That has improved, I mean, this is 20 years ago. Um, but also, um, I think the stigma, like you were talking about, is huge. Um, I went back to England in June, and I have a 17-year-old son, and he was gonna take a friend with him, and, um, his mom was um, really concerned when I told her that they were going to be riding the public transit over there. And um, she's like, um, really? On their own? And I'm like, yes, it's fine. That's how they get around. If we don't, you know, we're not going to get around. We're not, I'm not hiring a car. And um, she actually made some other excuse and they didn't go to England. And I think that had a big part of it, which is really sad. You know, but I kept trying to say to her, it's okay, that's how it's done, that's normal, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think the transit here, there's limited routes or routes. Um, so when you're out in the suburbs or less West Little Rock, like um, Antoine was saying, it's um, hard to get to a hub to get the bus to where you're going. In England, they do have limited bus routes, but they have main um, hubs like main streets and then they have little filter streets into the neighborhoods that go around and they're not as frequent but that's what makes it really easy for people to get around and when you've got the summer time here in Arkansas you know people waiting for a bus in the height of the summer when you've got to wait a long time and you've got to walk to get to a bus is really not is going to turn people off <laughs> yeah that no. humidity is a killer isn't mm -hmm. it yeah. Well, thank you for offering your insight, and uh, I imagine that uh, that is a real challenge that we definitely need to address. Well, and I would just say, and I'm Becca Green, I'm the Director of Public Engagement at Rock Region Metro. Um, that's something that we've heard before, and it goes back to the funding issue. You know, how are you going to get people to to take a different mode of transit. Well, it's got to be competitive with what they're using right now. So it's got to be fast, safe, affordable, convenient, all those things. And right now, we've, we've done a lot of work on making sure that we have a mobile app. It was developed by a team out in LA. The LA Transportation Department uses it. It's awesome. And we've done about as much as we can to move the needle without the thing that matters the most, which is the service, the type of service, the frequency, and, and where it goes. And that, that's the hang up. You, you got to have money to put those things in place. So we are aware of that, and I appreciate your comments because that is the crux of the problem, but you can't have that um, change happen without the investment first. P Pam, a quick... Uh, 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 Sorry, go ahead, Art. Uh, uh, a very quick tie on to that, because I think that connects back to your good question about what about other regions in the country. The community speaks to you when you get there, and the development patterns follow the transportation investment choices that have been made. So if you, you, know, uh, if, uh, you make the good transportation choice, the, the system will grow around that, and the development patterns will, and then you have a transit-oriented community all of a sudden, but it starts with the investment choices. Thank you. We have one question here, and we'll get to you in just a minute. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kirk Myers. I'm the president of the Briarwood Area Neighborhood Association, just right in the middle of Little Rock. Um, and I work out in West Little Rock, so I'm, I'm the opposite commute that you have, Antoine. Um, so I have the same problem on that end. The bus leaves me about two miles short. And, uh, and not only that, but that last stretch of Chanel from about Home Depot out to West Little Rock, it's a really narrow, dangerous road. I don't really feel comfortable on a bike there. I, I do want to give a shout out to my son, Tyler. He's, uh, he's 19. He's uh, taking the bus system for how long now, Tyler? A year and a half. So he, he takes it to his job. He takes it to school. Um, and 
And even more than that, he actually, we, we sat down, because, you know, teenagers, they want a car, right? I mean, so badly. So he, he wanted a car, and that's what he was going for. Well, for the cost of insurance for a 19-year-old male, uh, I, can in, I can insure my motorcycle, a car, and my house, and it's still cheaper than the cost of his insurance, which he's paying for, by the way. So when he laid out the numbers and he looked at it, it, it was hands down, like, even, as much as he wants a car, and he does, uh, he's like, it, I can save so much money taking the bus. And so he's committed to taking the next year so that he can save money for his future by taking the bus. So anyway, that, we're, we're real proud of him. Um, but I would love to take the bus. But I even looked at it for tonight. I said, you know what, I should take the bus to this thing because that, that just feels right. But um, <laughs> the last bus home's at 7.30. So if we ran a little bit late, I couldn't get home. So <laughs> again, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your insight. And thank you for sharing your son's story yeah. about loving to ride the bus. We have a question right here, if you don't mind. Um, so I'm a teacher at Central High School and previously taught at Boston Public Schools. And in Boston, all middle school and high school students take the public transportation. Um, so I'm curious to this idea of how we change stigma and how we could potentially increase the number of people on our bus. What are your thoughts on changing our school system so that middle school and high school students would begin to take public transit as opposed to school buses? Um, so just your thoughts on that. Uh, that's a conversation that Becca and I had briefly uh, before uh, we started tonight. And I think that the concept is sound. I mean, obviously these kids are riding buses to go to school. Why not use the public transportation system? But as I understand, there are some logistical hangups, and I'll allow Becca or Jared to kind of uh, jump into it some more. But I, I agree. There are schools within Little Rock that are using public transit and are having great success with it. There are, uh, as my understanding, Rock Re Region Metro provides a discounted service to some of those kids to use this, uh, that service. So there are efforts to be made to try to make that happen. Um, trying to put it on a bigger scale with the Little Rock School District or the Pulaski County School District, I think there are some logistical hurdles that uh, have prevented that. And I, I don't know if Jared or Becca want to kind of talk about those specifically, but I, I understand that that's a thought I had um, so it's a great thought because I had it. But, um, there, but there, thank you, Anton. But aren't there some cooperative agreements right. with the, some of the colleges? Yeah. So one thing, one of the hurdles that we have that Antoine touched on is that the federal trans again, it goes back to funding silos, uh, right? The federal government likes to give you money and for exact specific purposes. Uh, we are somewhat limited in how we provide service to schools. We can't design a route to make sure it gets kids to school. Uh, we can design a system, and then you know, obviously in Little Rock, most of them are going to touch schools. Uh, there, so there's some planning hurdles we've got to go through to make that happen. But we do a tremendous amount of travel training with students. Uh, obviously, um, uh, the, the, the charter schools in our region do not have uh, school, uh, school buses. And so a lot of the charter schools actually put their kids on the bus. East M is a part of their charter. They're required to buy their students a bus pass. And so many of them do that. Um, but also, you, Pam, you were referencing uh, Pulaski Tech. Uh, we have got a great, uh, we just finished up one year of a two-year pilot program with Pulaski Tech in which the school pays Rock Region Metro an annual fee and every student, faculty, and staff member rides the system for free. There's no additional fare paid. It's paid by the institution. And that netted Rock Region Metro 64,000 trips uh, this last calendar year. So those types of partnerships are, is something that we're piloting and that we absolutely want to continue um, to discuss with Little Rock and North Little Rock School District and Pulaski County. And I would just add to that that we, we do um, give student discounts, and, uh, and already bus passes are heavily subsidized, as you just heard tonight, from our local jurisdictions that pay in, from the federal government, a, a little bit from state. And so um, the fares are quite reasonable, and then for students, they're half the cost. So, so we have those um, opportunities in place to help students. Also, um, since I've come on board, I've started working with some folks to try to do more transit training. So um, right now, I, I, we used to get a lot of uh, preschool teachers, you might relate to this, they, they want to do their community helper segment, you know, so they want people to bring out the fire truck and the police cars and all that stuff. And I said, how about this? Why not, instead of us bringing out a bus to you, why don't you let me give you a free field trip on our system using it and teach your children how to use the system? Because that's a skill they have for life. That's learning and that's teaching. Awesome. 
Uh, let's, let's get the mayor and then we'll take some more questions up front. Oh, thank you, Pam. Uh, I wanted to focus uh, a couple of thoughts on what some people have said about how do we really put this into action. And uh, particularly as it relates to the issue of dedicated funding, uh, that's really the key. And I want to compliment Jared and the, the, the campaign committee that we had when we almost got it passed. It was, uh, this has been tried many times before, and, and we almost got over the, over the top on it. And so, as Art mentioned, uh, trying again, I think, is a very good strategy. Um, it does take education. It does take that concerted effort. We're paying several, the city of Little Rock, out of their general fund, pays several million dollars a year uh, to do the kind of things that we do for the miles that are, are, are done in the city of Little Rock on public transit. Uh, on our bus system, but uh, if we could do a dedicated source of funding, and I say this in the context that our local sales tax is a penny and a half here in the city of Little Rock, and all of our friends in our cities in the northwest part of the state, typically a little bit more conservative than we are, uh, have two cents in terms of their local sales tax. So a quarter penny even still puts us less than some of the people that we suggest are uh, are, uh, we're we're, we're uh, competing with, and uh, I will tell you that the gross domestic product in the state of our in, in Little Rock, North Little Rock, and Conway is about 34 million or 34 million dollars a year, in contrasted with about 20 million in Northwest Arkansas. So we should pat ourselves on the back a little bit about our what we're doing on economic development. We we just don't say it loudly enough sometimes, or exactly. maybe we got a bit of an inferiority complex about it. Now the other thing I would suggest is that it really and that has to do with the stigma issue. It really is an educational issue. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to put a challenge out to all of you on a couple of things right now. Number one is uh, every year uh, since I've been mayor, I've been doing a ditch the keys. And we ditch the keys and we ride bikes, we walk, we use alternative forms of transportation. And the second thing I do is I got a mayor's car free challenge for a whole week. And you can do anything but drive your car. So you can walk, you can take the bus, you can ride a bike. You can ride your bike to the bus and put your bike on the bus. And Antoine, I think that's what you probably need to do. <laughs> uh, you, can even, you can even hitch a ride with somebody else in terms of car sharing. But if we, as, as people who are concerned enough to come here tonight, would do that in concert with a campaign, we can begin to educate some of the people that are not here about the importance of a public transit system to our citizens in terms of uh, the ease of getting around and also uh, the economic development benefits that it ultimately brings to the community. So that's the challenge. You're going to see it again, and I hope that you'll take me up on the challenge when, uh, when you see it coming down the road. Thank you, Mayor, and we do want to be respectful of all of your time tonight. We're committed to 7 p.m., so we're just going to take two questions, if you don't mind, and please be brief. Which gentleman in the all back? The in the okay, back. all the way in the back. Thank you. I, I just wanted to mention that I, in things I've seen around the world and the country and things that are happening, uh, a lot of people think outside the box when they're planning ahead. And I saw something recently. I'm a snow skier, and so this kind of hit me. There was a city that needed to get from point A to point B, and it was very congested. So they just put up a a uh, gondola, and <laughs> it's working. You know, they're getting people, you know, from a half a mile or a mile or whatever to another place in the city by a little footprint, uh, not taking a lot of space, and people are enjoying the ride. So think outside the box when we look at future ideas. Thank you. And we'll take one more question. Um, let's get this gentleman on that side of the room. I think I'm loud this, the um, comment about the empty bus uh, I thought was uh, appropriate for not having been published, but the positive side of that is in the middle of the day if the bus is empty, it's a sign that everybody's at work or everybody's at school. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I think we will conclude our evening. I do have just a, oh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. <laughs> That was an observation. When, when we talk about multimodal, we normally talk about those things that are currently in existence as we did tonight. We talked about the Arkansas River, which I believe would be an excellent place 
for ferry. Maybe folks from West Little Rock all the way to the port. The Rock region could pick up those passengers and take them to the final destination wherever uh, the ferry would stop. The second thought I had was trains. I believe there is a train system that comes from Perry all the way to Little Rock, and it too uh, is along the Arkansas River. But I've never heard anybody bring up those types of those kinds of uh, transportation when we're talking multimodal and tying it into existing systems. Thank you very much for offering that. If I may, I just want, uh, a few people talk about uh, empty buses, and I, I would call that the empty bus myth because your transit system carries almost three million passengers per year. And if you just do the math, the number of buses we have out there, it's impossible uh, for a bus, or for many of the buses, to be uh, just one of the three million passengers. Um, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Maybe it was a charter bus, much. not a Rock Region Metro <laughs> bus. He saw go by. Do you mind handing him the microphone, and we're going to conclude with that, with uh, Judge That's Wines. also one of my biggest irritants when I hear somebody say that. When I hear somebody say that, I tell them to turn around, look at that street, see how empty it is. The point is the apples to apples deal. And th those folks who are looking at empty buses forget that our streets are empty three quarters of the time. And we're still putting money into them. If you're doing it on the basis of money, we all tear the street out. <laughs> Stop being used. Thank you very much. Jeff I think Lyons. he ought to run for public office. See? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we need, to, uh, we need to share just a few resources with you before we wrap up our evening together. Uh, once again, let's give a nice round of applause to our panelists. Thank you for sharing your insight, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we want to say thank you to the Clinton School of Public Service and Rock Region Metro for hosting this wonderful meeting. And we want to remind you about the resources for you to check out Rock Region Metro, we're, we're going to give Rex a time out. Uh, Rock Region Metro is a co-presenter for the event tonight, and they have an agency Facebook page. We encourage you to like their page and follow them on Twitter. They also have an e-newsletter. There is a Facebook group called the Rock Region Transit Alliance for those interested in advocacy for public transit and related modes of transit. There are members of the Bicycling Advocacy of Central Arkansas here tonight. Want to raise your hands and wave? <laughs> as well as Bike Ped representatives. Thank you very much for being here. The Arkansan Coalition for Obesity Prevention and Disability Rights, Arkansas, are groups interested in health benefits and accessibility concerns related to multimodal transportation. There are also several members of the Little Rock Regional Chamber, Think Big Little Rock Group here tonight. If you would raise your hands, we're glad you're here to support this effort. Thank you for being here. As well as other chamber members who have been involved with the annual Create Little Rock pop-up in the Rock event. And members of Studio Maine are here tonight as well as uh, also our illustrious superintendent, Mike Poor. I got to give him a shout out. Uh, if you're interested in continuing this conversation, we encourage you to get involved with the groups that we've mentioned to you. And also keep an eye out for events that may be of interest to you. Thank you again for your time and attention, and we hope you have a wonderful night.